Open with me to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Considering the circumstances, we're going to take a brief break from the Psalms of Ascent, but we'll pick right back up with the Psalms of Ascent next week. In Luke's gospel, what he presents over and over is this reminder that Jesus is the Savior of the whole world. That he is not just the Savior of Israel. He's the Messiah for Gentiles to the ends of the earth. And what this does is it shifts Israel's expectations, and in many ways, it confronts their nationalism. Because this was not what they were expecting. And the section that we're going to be in today is often called the Road to Jerusalem. It's chapters 9 through 19 in the Gospel of Luke. And what's amazing about this section is it's a lot of the material that's here is unique to Luke. Luke was a remarkable journalist in the way that he interviewed eyewitnesses and put together um, this gospel, talking to the actual people that witnessed these things in Jesus' life. In chapters 9 through 19, what we hear twice in chapter 9 is that Jesus sets his face towards Jerusalem. He sets his face like flint towards Jerusalem, and what that means is that in chapter 9, Jesus shifts gears, and he is intent on heading towards the cross. And this entire section then must be understood in terms of that. In many ways, what happens in this section is that Jesus prepares his disciples for his ascension into heaven. He prepares them for what it will look like after his death. And what we see is the religious leaders and the leaders of Israel become more and more and more agitated and angry as he teaches and as he lives. And each story in chapters 9 through 19 prepare us to respond to the cross. With this in mind, let's pray before we consider this text. Heavenly Father, as we approach a very familiar text, I pray, Lord, that we would not close our hearts and our minds to it, but that, Lord, you would open our eyes and that we would see it with new eyes. And like Barry just prayed, that we would respond to it with our whole lives. Thank you for the gift of your word. Thank you for the gift of one another. And it's in your precious name that I pray. Amen. We'll be reading from Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 25. And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. This is God's Word. We have a tendency with this passage in particular to put ourselves into the story. And this is good, right? Jesus says, which of these three proved to be a neighbor? And he says, go and do likewise. The whole point, the whole thrust of the passage is that Jesus would want us to imitate the Samaritan. However, in keeping with the tone and purpose of this section where Jesus has set his face towards Jerusalem, and we are looking towards the cross, my hope is that today we would see that this text, yes, it is about us, but it is primarily about the work of Jesus. 
that the story of the Good Samaritan that we've heard over and over and over again has become so part of our culture that you can say Good Samaritan and non-believers around our world know what you're talking about, but that this is primarily about Jesus. And so I'd like for us to consider four things today. We'll see the mercy that Jesus shows, the wounds that Jesus heals, the price that Jesus pays, and the challenge that Jesus gives. The wounds of Jesus, the wounds, the the mercy of Jesus, the wounds of Jesus, the price of Jesus, and the challenge of Jesus. And so it's my hope is that belonging to Jesus, we would become like him. And having received the mercy of Jesus, we would then be moved to turn and show the mercy of Jesus. So, let's dig in. First, the mercy that Jesus shows. Look with me at verses 25 through 33. Remember, the lawyer was an expert in the law of God. We hear lawyer and think something else. He's an expert in the scriptures, and he stands up to put Jesus to the test. Like I said earlier, the leaders are becoming increasingly agitated and angry the more Jesus teaches and the more the people begin to listen to him and follow him. And to his question, Jesus gives a very orthodox answer, a very straightforward answer that any Israelite would know. He responds with the two greatest commandments from the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Love the Lord your God with heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so when the lawyer comes back with this very good response, in verse 28, Jesus says something very interesting. Look with me. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Is Jesus saying that you can do something to inherit eternal life? Is this going against everything that's preached from this pulpit week in and week out? Do this and you will live? Is this legalism? Is this moralism? Is this works righteousness? No, not at all. This lawyer has just said that he loves the Lord with heart, mind, soul, and strength that he really does believe that he has done everything that it takes to love God with everything. Jesus' answer, do this and you will live, is true. Friends, we have to remember, we are saved by righteousness, aren't we? It's just not ours, because no one can do this. This summarizes the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments, love God, the last six, love one another. Jesus says, go do this, live in complete perfection, live in complete holiness, and you will live. What it shows to us is that love involves devotion and trust, but it does also involve obedience. Not only obedience, but it involves obedience, because loving God and loving neighbor is a tall order, and yet it is still a command for us. But friends, from Abraham until now, We receive eternal life only by loving and believing in the name of God. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. It's always been the way of salvation. Believe God and it is counted to you as righteousness. It is nothing that we do. It is only in our belief, believing in God. But obedience, then, is the evidence that God has done a miracle in our hearts. Obedience flows out of something that the Holy Spirit has done in our hearts. When my daughter eats a snow cone and she comes home and I'm saying, let me guess, you had a a, um, bubblegum snow cone. She's socked, right? How'd you know? Her tongue is blue. The blue tongue is evidence that the blue, that the... uh, Um, bubblegum snow cone had already been there, right? For us, the humble, continually repentant love for God and neighbor is proof that the Holy Spirit has already been there. It flows out of it. Notice verse 29. But he, the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, 
said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? He moves from seeking to know what he must do to eternal life and now, and to catch Jesus, right? To trick Jesus. And he moves to justifying himself, to prove himself. The sense of his question is this. Who is the bare minimum of people I have to love and still say that I love God? Who is the bare minimum of people that I have to love and still say that I love God? Because surely neighbor can't mean everyone. Jesus responds with this parable. Much has been made of the priests and the Levite and why they pass by on the other side, but we are not given any motives. And it's actually not helpful for us to speculate on why the priests and the Levite pass by on the other side and don't stop to help the man. But I do want you to think about the audience, who Jesus is talking to. He's talking to experts in the law of God. He's talking to religious people. And so this, the priest and the Levite, would have been the people that the religious folks around him would have held in highest esteem. Those are the folks who are good. Those are the folks who love God and love neighbor. And he shows that they are not the hero of this story. The priest and the Levite here represent the responsibility for making sacrifices in the temple. But remember Jesus' words in just a few chapters ago in Matthew chapter 9, 13. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. So, we don't know why the priest and the Levite did not stop and help the man on the side of the road. But what we do know is that getting involved in the pain and the mess of other people's lives is costly and it often hurts. Getting involved in the sin and mess and disaster of someone else's life is costly and it often hurts. But friends, we receive God's mercy. We receive the mercy of God in order to then turn and show that mercy. We cannot divorce what we say we love from what we actually do. When we say we love God, that means we love all those made in His image. That then turns to show mercy to all who are made in the image of God. Samaritan, like I said earlier, has become so familiar to us in our cult, not just our culture, but our world, that we come to hear it and think of the ideal person. A good Samaritan is, by, in our minds, a wonderful person who stops and helps. But when that ha- because that has happened, we've lost the shock that this passage is intended. The shock and the offense that would have been heard by this lawyer when he heard Jesus tell this story. What this lawyer would have heard was traitor, impure, someone to be loathed and hated. What was behind this phrase, Samaritan, to this lawyer was 700 years of animosity ever since the northern king of Israel fell to the Assyrians in 1722. Israelites looked to Samaritans with religious and ethnic hatred. They saw them as half-breeds. They saw their religion as the true religion of the one true God mixed with the nations around them, and they hated them. There was so much enmity, so much animosity. This was a religious and a racial hatred. And Jesus puts this man in someone else's shoes and challenges the core of his identity and his pride. Friends, we also see that mercy in this passage flows from a love that is not passive love. This is not a passive love. 
The priest and the Levite, by walking by on the other side, did not express overt hatred, did they? You don't have to say, I don't hate anybody. You can say, I don't hate anybody, while still being indifferent, which in many ways can be worse. But love, the mercy that flows out of love, moves towards others. And though it may not be visible and overt hatred, uncaring indifference is often the way that hatred is expressed. Walking by on the other side. The shock of this parable is that the Samaritan is a picture of the mercy and compassion of Jesus himself. The Samaritan is actually the picture of Jesus. But let's back up. What is compassion? Compassion is a feeling. Feeling sadness when we see someone else who is hurt with an impetus, with a movement towards doing something to help. Does that make sense? Feeling sadness when someone else is hurt with a movement towards doing something to help. But mercy is an added layer to compassion. Mercy is an added layer to compassion. Mercy is showing compassion when we don't have to, when we don't want to, and when we have good reason not to. Mercy is showing compassion when we don't have to, don't want to, or have good reason not to. With his face set towards the cross, Jesus illustrates his compassion for you in this story. Romans 5, 8, But God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Mark 6, when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep. They were like sheep without a shepherd. The Samaritan's mercy shows the mercy of Jesus to us in great detail. So let's dig a little bit deeper into the imagery that we're given here in this parable. We've seen the mercy of Jesus. Let's turn to the wounds that Jesus heals. Look with me at verse 34, the first part. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. He not only gives a welfare check and makes sure that he's still alive, but he heals his wounds. He tends to him and he cares for him. Verse 30 tells us that he was half dead. He was dying. If someone had not intervened, this man would have died. And there's a detail here that we're tempted to pass over. He bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. You can imagine this is in an era before antiseptics. Wine then would clean the wound and prevent further infection. But what is this oil piece? He didn't have to do this piece. The oil was to soothe the wound. The oil shows that he cared not just about this man's survival, but about easing his pain. He poured on both oil and wine. Friends, we are a robbed and wounded people, longing for life-saving cleansing and relief from pain. Sin and death robs us of the joy that we are meant for in the image of God and we bear wounded hearts and bodies through the effects of sin. And we sin against and wound one another, don't we? We sin against and wound one another. And if those wounds remain unhealed, it leads to great harm, profound effects in our lives and in our relationships. But friends, like the Samaritan, Jesus is the despised and rejected one who binds up those wounds. Jesus is the despised and rejected one who binds up our wounds. Like Wright read earlier in our call to worship, Psalm 147, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. So Jesus heals us, but he does more than just bind up our wounds. He also suffered wounds that were meant for us. He binds up our earthly wounds, but he also bore the wounds that were meant for us. From our Old Testament scripture reading, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, 
yet we esteemed him stricken, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Blood like wine, washing away the stain, cleansing us from the poison, the infection of sin, and blessing. Picture it in the Old Testament as oil. There's this picture of oil running down your hair and across your beard. Weird to us, I know, but back then very meaningful. The oil of blessing, the wine of purification and life and celebration poured out for us. He was wounded for our transgressions. I've told you guys a bunch of times that I grew up in South Louisiana, but I am not a fisherman in any way, shape, or form. And I've only been deep sea fishing one time. I was a kid, probably 10 or 11, and I have to be honest that I spent the majority of the time over the side of the boat. I won't go into too much more detail there. It was a terrible, terrible experience. But our fishing guide told me not to let my line down too far into the water because they are what are known as hardhead catfish, that have a spine, their dorsal fin has a poisonous spine. You have to be very, very careful, and you don't want to pull them out of the water. Well, what did I do? I immediately caught a hardhead catfish, and I pull it up out of the water, and it's swinging there, and it's about to swing into the boat, and we were fishing with our assistant pastor at the time. And I can't remember if he was wearing the, the glove that he should have been wearing or if he just acted in the moment, But before that fish came to me, he reached out and grabbed it on top of that dorsal fin and helped me get the hook out. And his hand started swelling up beyond belief because of the poisonous spine. It may seem too obvious. It's almost like too too obvious of an illustration. But friends, that man that day was literally pierced for my transgression. That was my fish. I deserve to deal with it. I deserve to take that hook out. But he was willing to step in the way and take that wound for me. He incurred the pain that I deserved. He was pierced for my transgression. This parable shows the mercy of Jesus particularized for you and that he not only heals our wounds, but he suffers them in our place. May we not only enjoy the benefits of of Jesus suffering in our place, right? It's easy to enjoy those benefits. But may we also seek opportunities to step in between for others. Imitating our Savior, stepping in between for others. We've seen the mercy that Jesus shows, the wounds that Jesus heals. Next, let's look at the price that Jesus pays. Look with me at verse 34 again and into the verse 35, the last half of 34. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, that's two whole days worth of wages. He was likely doing business traveling between Jerusalem and Jericho on that dangerous road. Two whole days of wages and he gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. If this man wakes up in this inn with no one and with no money, he would have to stay in indentured slavery till he pays off his debt to the inn. He's there until he works off his debt. But the Samaritan gives him this money, two days' worth of salary. And by paying the price, the Samaritan, in a very real way, buys him back from slavery buys him back from slavery. This is what it means to be redeemed, right? For the price to be paid, bought with a price. And this is what it means for us to call ourselves redeemer. Looking to the one who paid the greatest price for our freedom. Friends, you owe a debt. From the moment you were born, your very life In the same way that an artist who creates a work of art owns that art, your life is owned by the one who created you. All those who are made in the image of God belong to him.
by their very birth. But Christ laid down his perfect life as our priceless ransom, as our priceless ransom. He did not leave us on our own. He did not then just redeem us and set us free and say, okay, you're good to go. No, he redeemed us and then brought us into his family. He redeemed us and then adopted us. Galatians 4, God sent forth his son to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive adoption as sons and daughters. Now, remember the lawyer's first question. Do you remember what it was? What must I do to inherit eternal life? You can't do anything to inherit something. By definition, an inheritance is passed down through the family and received when someone dies. You do nothing to inherit. You do nothing to inherit. The Father is the one who owns eternal life, and He gives this to those who are in His family, inherited at the death of Jesus. I've been dressing out of my dad's closet for years. As a teenager, I thought it was hilarious to find the things that he had cast off as tacky from the 70s and 80s. I was just like, well, if you're done with it, I will definitely continue to use this. It was, it was, a, it was a point of connection between me and my dad, all growing up, wearing his clothes. Now that he's gone, it's a way that I remember him. And just, I think it was Father's Day weekend, I went into his closet and I look up and I see this box. It's Nike, a Nike sneakers box. And I pull it down and it's the most perfect pair of white retro tennis shoes. And they're my size. I'm like, Dad, I didn't even know you had these. And now I've got them at home. I'm so nervous to wear them though because they're bright white and I can't keep them clean. I enjoy these things that were my dad's to remember him by. And for any of you who's ever lost someone, though, I know that you, like me, would give it all back if you could have a little bit more time with them, right? You'd give it all back if you could have just a little bit more time with them. But the good news is that my father now enjoys an inheritance that is unfading, an inheritance that is imperishable, an inheritance that will not stain and wear out like those shoes. I will see him again. He has his inheritance while I still wait for mine. Friends, Jesus paid it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washes it white as snow. Friends, not only has he paid your debt, he has redeemed us from slavery, and we now enjoy his inheritance. So wear it. Walk around in it. Walk in that inheritance. Enjoy it. His inheritance is unfading and imperishable, so walk in it because he's paid the price. We've seen the mercy that Jesus shows, the wounds that Jesus heals, the price that Jesus pays. Now let's turn to the challenge that Jesus gives. Look with me at verses 36 and verse 37. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. The question for the lawyer and for us is, who is the true neighbor? And Jesus could have said a man, right? He could have said a man came by the road and stopped and helped. As if his ethnicity... And his culture did not matter. But he doesn't do that. He says a Samaritan stopped and helped and was the true neighbor. He made it very clear that this man was a Samaritan. But notice the lawyer doesn't even name this man using the same word that Jesus does. He says the one who showed him mercy. He doesn't say the Samaritan. Because remember, there would have been no such thing as a good Samaritan in this man's world. But then Jesus tells those listening to go and do likewise. Go act like the worst of the worst, the people you hate, because I have given you the best of the best. 
Go live like and love the worst of the worst because I have given you the best of the best. Why are we called to show mercy? Because if you belong to Jesus, you will become like Jesus and imitate him. If you've received the mercy of God, we move towards showing that same mercy. So, in light of what Jesus has done for us, maybe it's time to seek forgiveness, restitution, repair for the people that we have hurt with religious, political, racial pride, personally, in our families, our very real neighbors and our neighborhoods. Maybe it's time to show sacrificial, costly mercy and compassion to someone who may not say thank you and in whom we may not be able to see any good intentions. Maybe it's time to become prodigal, meaning reckless, seemingly reckless and wasteful. Maybe it's time to become prodigal with our time, our talents, and our money for the good of someone who can do us absolutely no good. Loving with no expectation, no expectation of anything in return. We've seen the mercy that Jesus showed us on the cross, the wounds that he bore for us on the cross, the price that he paid for us on the cross, and all these are valid, good, and true teachings of this text. That this is a picture of Jesus and the work that he has done. But we do a great disservice by seeing this text only in spiritual terms. Jesus told us parables that were spiritual in nature. Think about Luke 18, where you've got the Pharisee and the tax collector, and they're in the temple, and they're both praying. One says, God, thank you for not making me like this man. The other one says, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He tells parables that are directly spiritually applied But friends, this is a story about responding to the physical sufferings of our neighbors. Responding to the physical sufferings of our neighbors. J.I. Packer, who passed away on Friday at the age of 93, said in his remarkable book, Knowing God, he said this, It is to our shame and disgrace today that so many Christians... I will be more specific. So many of the soundest and most orthodox Christians go through this world in the spirit of the priest and the Levite in our Lord's parable, seeing human needs all around them, but after a pious wish and perhaps a prayer that God might meet those needs, averting their eyes and passing by on the other side. If God in mercy revives us, one of the things he will do will be to work this spirit of mercy into our hearts and lives. If we desire spiritual quickening for ourselves, one step we should take is to seek to cultivate this spirit. And then he quotes 2 Corinthians chapter 8. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become cultivate the spirit of mercy, the mercy that Jesus has shown us towards those around us. The question for us is this, do we care enough to help? Are we willing to become proximate to suffering? Or are we more comfortable caring only spiritually from a distance? Friends, as you seek to answer that question, as I seek to answer that question, there's only one place to turn. Because that question is enormous. The only place we have to turn to answer that question is the throne of Jesus. He shows you mercy. He heals your wounds. He pays the greatest price. Now he challenges you. Belong to him. Become like him. Receive his mercy and show it to your neighbors and to one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do not love you with heart, mind, soul, and strength, and we do not love our neighbor as ourselves all of the time, but we pray, Lord, that you would cultivate in our hearts by your Holy Spirit a spirit of mercy and compassion. Thank you for being so compassionate and so merciful to us. Out of thankfulness and not out of shame, not out of guilt, may we turn out of that and follow you. 
in your footsteps. Thank you for the freedom that we have for this in you. We love you, and it's in your precious name that I pray. Amen.